I bought, I love these cameras, so I bought seven of them. All the gentlemen take their cameras <laughs> Yes, sir. Apparently a problem with the sensor. They, yes, they have a problem. Everything else about the camera is great. So now I have five first cameras. Everybody, is it on? It is. Okay. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. um, welcome to our candidates forum. The Longmont Area Democrats is ho hosting this. Uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you to Charles for 723. Um, and um, there is a donation box just near the doorway on the way out if you guys care to. Uh, contribute just a little bit toward the Keep the Lights On Fund here at 723. So thank you for coming. Um, I was asked, I am Marisa Dirks, I am the Secretary for Longmont Area Democrats, and I was asked to say a few things about the forum tonight. Welcome everyone, sorry for standing in front of you here. Um, LAD has hosted this event a few times in the past. Um, the last one was at the City Council uh, election race in 2009. Uh, as you know, the Longmont City Council election is a nonpartisan election, and so it would be inappropriate for Longmont Area Democrats to officially endorse any candidate, so we do not do that. But we host this forum with the purpose of uh, simply giving citizens the opportunity to ask questions of the candidates, to listen to those answers, and for the candidates to describe where they stand on the issues and the challenges that face Longmont. Um, we sent the call out for questions. We received uh, lots of questions, and we are receiving them as I speak. Um, uh, and so all candidates uh, were invited to participate. Some people um, had scheduling conflicts, and other people uh, chose not to participate. But I want to thank all of the candidates here tonight uh, for participating. I'm so um, honored and happy to have you here. Um, just on a personal note, I am so impressed with anybody that steps up, you know, rolls up their sleeves and, and decides to try to make a difference and um, appreciate it very much. You're making a difference just by stepping up, so thank you very much. And so the next thing I want to do, I'm a little nervous, um, I want to uh, introduce um, John D'Amica. And we had asked him to uh, moderate tonight, and I don't know him very well, but we, we had a long conversation about, well, democracy, and about an informed citizenry. And it, it, it reminded me of a quote, and I found it, from Thomas Jefferson, uh, an informed citizenry is the, is the only true repository of the public will. So that's kind of like why we're here tonight. Um, John has lived in Colorado probably most of his life and has lived in Longmont for 15 years and in talking with him and uh, going over all of the wonderful questions that were submitted, um, I'm sure that he's going to moderate this in a very balanced manner and uh, it should make for a really great evening and thank you again, thanks for everybody coming tonight and thanks for all of you showing up, so here we go, here's John. Thank you again for coming. I mean, we couldn't do it all without you and candidates for being here. We've got a, a great turnout of people from Longmont and candidates here. So um, I'm going to read here so I don't uh, miss anything as far as how we're going to conduct the forum here tonight. So we have a short amount of time to ask a large number of questions that we've got here uh, from the audience. So uh, I'll respectfully request 
Let the audience not take time away from the candidates by cheers, or likewise the opposite. <laughs> In addition, I'll attempt to keep the candidates' answers on topic on, and on schedule. And if any of the candidates would like to comment on another candidate's answers, please raise their hand and if time allows, I will call on that candidate to keep their response not more than 30 seconds. So I'll try to keep follow-up questions from the candidates to a minimum so that we can get to as many questions from the audience as possible. Our goal is to create a platform for the candidates to express their views on topics that are of interest to the voters. More than likely, we have more questions than time this evening, so I expect we'll not get all, to all the questions. However, I hope we can get to those questions that most appeal to the candidates' constituency. So we've tried to address certain questions uh, where we think are appropriate. We'll first start with two-minute opening statements from each of the candidates. We will then begin with questions and answer, the question and answer portion of the forum. That portion will end at approximately 8.30. At that time, each of the candidates will have two minutes for closing comments, and we'll attempt to wrap up the evening at about 8.45. So, with that being, oh, and one more comment is we've got one mic in front, so there's going to be a lot of shifting of the mic across the table, but with that, we're going to go, hey, well, and the, the timekeeper, Marilyn, Marilyn, and there she is with her stop and start, well, stop signs, and also, I think there's a 30 second yield to start yeah. to slow down and wrap it up. So, uh, with that, I'm going to go right down the line and... Dennis Coombs? Actually, we're going to start with, we're just going to go right there. Are we going to start right? Yeah. Sean McCoy. Hi, I'm Sean McCoy. Uh, I uh, have uh, spent the last uh, four years on city council, but I've spent the last 16 years prior to that serving on different boards and commissions. On uh, Most recently on the Park, Boulder County Parks and Open Space Commission. Uh, prior to that, I was on uh, the Police Standards Boards, moving backwards. I was on the Planning and Zoning Commission. I was liaison from that Planning and Zoning Commission to the uh, uh, Airport Advisory Board. And uh, I've been the Vice Chair of the Human Relations Commission. Uh, I have uh, spent a uh, lifetime, the last 20 years, uh, serving this community. Uh, and, and I will tell you that, you know, uh, this is my home. Uh, I was born and raised here, as, as was my wife, Maureen, and, uh, and as uh, my two children, Claire and Molly. And, uh, and I'll have to tell you that uh, this is a beautiful town, and it has uh, all kinds of things to offer. And it's got the greatest people. But, you know, I think there's some things that we, we can all work on. And, uh, and right now, we're in some of the hardest economic times. You know, my father, many of you know, served 22 and a half years on city council. Well, I'll tell you something. Uh, he and I had a conversation, and he said, you know, the, what you've been going through uh, on city council uh, was different than the, when I was on city council. In all those years, we never had such a hard economic time. And so, I have to tell you, we've been faced with some very difficult times, and I have to tell you that uh, my commitment to Longmont regardless of, uh, of hard economic times, is, uh, is strong and true, and, uh, and I will uh, do everything I can to make opportunity happen here in Longmont. And if I have a couple of seconds left, I'll just let you know that I've got a master's in education, and uh, uh, am a teacher in Boulder Valley School District. And Ron? Hi, I'm Ron Gallegos. I was formally on the City Council in 1995, between 1995 and 1999, and yeah, your, your dad was right. Uh, times were uh, different then. We, uh, we got the museum in, we passed that bond issue, we did the rec center, we expanded the senior center, we bought Sandstone Ranch, we uh, encouraged uh, Amgem, Seagate, Home Depot, and Zidance to come in. Uh, these were different times then. I think we have a lot of opportunity now and a lot of challenges before us. I think one of the disappointments I'm seeing is we didn't take advantage of that fiber optic backbone. I think 
right now with the kind of smart jobs we could attract to our community, if we had that in place, I think it would be a real benefit to the community. With that said, those, those types of employers that are looking at our community kind of go through a checklist. One of the things we have a problem with is retail right now, both in the downtown area and the Blighted Mall. And uh, I, for one, we can't plant, plant any more bushes in the mall. We just can't hide the problem. It won't go away. I, I feel like we have the uh, tools in our toolbox. Using the right of eminent domain and condemnation would be a good time to take that blighted mall out and do a public-private partnership. Redevelop it similar to what they're doing in Taos in Minneapolis, where these become a community center type mall, and it becomes a, a, a draw to downtown. Let me say, uh, Sally Phillips, that Sally is here, and yeah, I did that in, did, uh, did by accident. Was it Dick Lamb's campaign that we got involved in? Yeah, yeah, many, many years ago. So I've been active, active in the party as a candidate in the past for lieutenant governor. I was the state party secretary, and I think I passed a sheet out. I've been involved in numerous boards and commissions here in town. Uh, where am I in time? Stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Well, my name is Sarah Levison, and I currently serve on the City Council at large. Um, I, have a, I have a record um, that I've been uh, working in the city very diligently. I have a creative thinker. I've lived in Longmont since 1997, and uh, in fact, this is really the only home that my second child ever has known, our home on Emory Street. Um, and uh, in my opinion, everybody can talk about the past, but what elections are really about is the future. And what I'm thinking is the future of Longmont is to um, have a city that continues to grow. We have great opportunities. We have to capitalize on those opportunities. You know, we can look in the past again and talk about the dying mall, but everyone knows that the face of retail is changing. And just as the Board of Realtors in our interview today asked a question about retail leaking to the east, I said, well, where the retail is leaking is to the cloud. And as part of my work on the uh, National Steering Committee for Finance for the National League of Cities, we did discuss um, uh, proposed legislation for Congress to do an internet sales tax. So we can actually begin to recoup some of the sales tax that's being lost through the internet. And that's a national issue. And, and frankly, there are some that don't want to talk about national issues, but what happens in Washington matters on Main Street. And I firmly believe that uh, the kind of um, leadership you need on council is someone thoughtful, someone creative, someone that does their homework and, and learns about all the different aspects of an issue and can bring some, some good solutions. Thank you. Hello. My name is Dennis Coombs. I'm a newcomer to politics. Uh, I'm a second generation Coloradan. I've lived here in Longmont for 31 years. Both my kids, uh, Aaron and Elson, have uh, were born and raised here. Um, they've both gone off and become lawyers, so they obviously got an excellent education at the St. Brain Valley School, so I'm happy for that. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful city. It's got great parks. It's got great people. The city employees are wonderful. Um, I've basically been trained as an engineer all my life. I've got a BS in electrical engineering and a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Washington. I worked 24 years at Ball Aerospace. I've got 31 years of experience in the aerospace industry. And uh, as an aerospace engineer, I really learned really good people skills at working with groups of people on really complicated problems. And uh, I've also got 15 years of experience in the restaurant business. You may know me as a pump house guy. I, Started the that was my midlife crisis starting the Pump House Brewery with three partners, and uh, I tell you, you have to have people skills in spades to be in the restaurant business and to survive 15 year partnership with the same partners and with have different pieces or different points of view and be able to work with those people and move the the ship forward in a positive direction really takes people skills and. The reason why I'm running is I think that I have the skill set to take this city to the next level. Um, particularly, I think the, the biggest challenge facing us is to pick the, the right city manager going forward. And if we get 
a really, you know, egotistical, hard-driving civic manager, to me that's not leadership style. You need someone, you know, like, like a Mike Butler, you know, that can give people freedom to make decisions. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Tiger. And I've uh, lived in Longmont about uh, 16 years. Uh, I lived in the county about 30 years, and uh, I lived in Boulder and Lafayette and some other places. My wife and I were looking for a home to buy, and we came to Longmont and fell in love with Longmont. Um, I, I think it's just the cat's meow. Uh, and it's got everything, and uh, the bike trails and, and all of that. In the last few years, it's really become marvelous. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I want to make sure that happens uh, is that we maintain all that we've built uh, and don't keep looking forward into the future at getting this and getting that and annexing this and building that up without maintaining what we have. And uh, <coughs> we've had uh, some comments uh, recently about how certain parks uh, which are uh, in the older parts of town that aren't uh, getting uh, what they need. Um, I live in Ward 1. Uh, I would like to have good representation in Ward 1. I think that I had great representation in Ward 1 with uh, Doug Brown. Um, and uh, I, uh, I talk to my neighbors and, and, and look for things that we can do. I'm into lifelong learning. Um, like uh, this gentleman here, I also have a technical degree in acoustical engineering. Watch me use it. Um, so, really the things that I, uh, I want to do, though, is work with others. I've worked on a lot of boards over uh, the last 15 years, uh, teamwork. Uh, I've worked with a lot of the people here in this room on various boards and learned and applied. And I'd like to be able to continue doing that, especially uh, in the future of finding a new city manager. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Suzanne Painter, and I'm a single mom of two in Ward 1. My children both go to schools in Ward 1, Skyline High School, I have a senior there, and I also have a daughter over at Trail Ridge. My commitment to Longmont is 10 years strong now. Prior to that, I was from California, in which I worked in the corporate sector for 10 years, serving clients like Nike, Oakley, Trek, and the like, and uh, learned a lot from my corporate experience there. Uh, learned to move at the speed of business. Since coming to Cal uh, Colorado 10 years ago, I've spent my time in the nonprofit uh, nonprofit sector only. I worked at the Boulder Chamber uh, for several years here in the Longmont Chamber, and also for the YMCA of Boulder Valley. This is where commerce and community comes from. This is where my uh, take on how to serve the community better comes from. In that commerce balances community and community balances commerce. One will not come without the other, one will not float without the other. And so uh, the things that are important to me are primary jobs, it's about the commerce. Once you bring primary jobs in, they invest back into community. Retail development, the mall is obvious, downtown, uh, downtown mama is obvious, what's not so obvious is what's in Ward 1, Middle Maine. Pace and 17th Street. Neither one of those have ever been full in the 10 years that I have lived in Longmont. I'd like to see a change. Um, on top of that would be leadership. That's where collaboration, cultural diversity, uh, and engagement with Ward 1. I currently sit on the SHS uh, Education Foundation and also on the Our Center Board. Truly my pleasure. Love being in my ward. Would love to represent it for the next three years on behalf of Longmont. Thank you. My name is Brian Hanson. I've been on city council for almost four years now. And I have to tell you, I really enjoyed this. This has been a, a great learning experience for me. Um, and I have to tell you what I really like the most about it um, is it, it, when I get to see you folks speak at uh, public and by to be heard, um, I really like to see how the citizens want to be involved in the government. I want to, I, I really enjoy all the input 
I think a lot of our decisions are influenced um, by the input that we have, hopefully more so than not. Um, but I, I also recognize the fact that our city council is very divided right now. Um, you know, if we don't get a unanimous vote on an issue, it's fairly straightforward. It's usually a 4-3 or 3-4 vote on something. And that really concerns me. Um, and I think it's going to stay that way for some time. And so I think the real reality that we need to deal with is how do we want those 4-3 or 3-4 votes going? Are they going the direction that you want, to, want them to go? And if you look at how the votes are dividing in the city council right now, all you have to do is look at how candidates were funded. Look at the, the money trail. See who took money from whom, and you can see how the votes are going to divide. And the question that I have for everybody is, do you want those votes to that we make essentially represent those citizens of the city of Longmont, or do we want them to be representative of some of those larger financial interests in the city of Longmont? And I would like to say that as a city council member, I'm going to minimize any um, finance that comes into my campaign that would, that would uh, in any way influence me that, that doesn't represent you as individuals. And so, like I say, I, I'm here. Okay, I guess I'm done. But thank you very much, and it's been an honor. Hi, I'm John Daniels. I've lived in the city for 22 years, my entire life. Um, one of the important things that, uh, one, one of my uh, guiding political philosophies is that one of the biggest problems with government is all the government. Um, one of my models is care enough not to interfere. And I think that a lot of the time, um, government on all levels, including city government, gets in the way of people being able to live the way they want, run their businesses the way they want, etc. And um, so that's the primary approach that I want to bring to this. Um, regarding the, uh, the mall issue, uh, mm -hmm. I believe it's inevitable that all retail is headed toward the internet and where possible there's a paradigm shift toward intangible electronic products. And so trying to attract more retail to the area is not probably the best decision. So I think regarding the mall, what it would be best to do is try to shift that development over toward services and attractions. Um, this is a family community and I think providing a place where families can bring their children and where families can spend time together would be a useful thing to do. For instance, um, my friends and I have been speaking to each other about this issue and we all think that one of the things that could be done is to provide a, or build a drive-in theater, which is something that would bring people in from all over the area that no other community has to offer. Um, it's this kind of innovative thinking that I think I can bring to this position based on speaking to people in the community. Thank you. And one thing I want to remind candidates is uh, hopefully we can have some cross conversations. So any of the candidates that are interested in commenting on uh, any of the other candidates' answers, uh, reminded they'll have 30 seconds to do so. So uh, to keep the mic flowing in the correct direction, I'm going to start with John Daniels. And the first question is. What are your thoughts about increasing the cultural events that may be drawn to our city? And I, I think that uh, you know, broader question that might be uh, Union Reservoir, Main Street events, uh, Saint Brain, uh, Greenway events. So, I think these kind of events are great for the community because they bring people together, and when people are brought together and they communicate with one another, good things happen, and that always results in growth for the community and um, a general sense of uh, cooperation. So sponsoring and encouraging those kind of events and um, providing areas like bike trails and swimming areas at Union Reservoir is only a good thing for the city. I think that uh, the city has done a pretty good job with developments in that vein over the last few years and uh, 
continuing with the same general course would be uh, a good action. Thank you. And next question. Mr. Coy. Now, let me get this straight here. If I understand correctly, uh, you didn't want government to get involved, but all the things that you talked about there were uh, was government getting involved. In. And uh, one of the things that we have is uh, is the real issue of uh, of the community uh, uh, deciding that uh, with our open space that we're not going to have a uh, have uh, our our environment uh, damaged by uh, by large crowds, and, and I guess I, I don't quite grasp his uh, the, the feature of his question or his answer in regards to that. So, thank you. I'm a little curious. Next question for Brian Hansen. We're going to still try to move it move it on down the line here. So, uh, Mr. Hansen, what would you do to bring fast tracks to Longmont sooner rather than later? Well, you know, you know, I supported us bringing fast tracks back to the ballot as early as we possibly can. Um, I've been very supportive of let's get going on that this train station as soon as we possibly can, so that they have to make that a destination. Um, and so, you know, in every way that we that I was able to, I've tried to support getting fast tracks here to the city of Longmont. I, that is money that, that comes out of our taxes. We've paid for having Fast Tracks come to the city of Longmont. I think it will be an excellent economic uh, development opportunity. I, I think a lot of people will take the train out here just to take it to the end, just to, to see what's out here and, and enjoy what's the, the city of Longmont. So I, I, I think Fast Tracks is a great idea. I, you know, there's some concern about what level of ridership we're going to get on fast tracks, but I think the bottom line is, as petroleum prices uh, continue to climb again, um, we've noticed that on mass transit, ridership always goes up as uh, fuel prices goes up, and I think um, the the train being different than other types of mass transit will have a very real draw to it that will bring people to the city that wouldn't otherwise come. So. Uh, I think fast tracks is a great idea, and I think uh, I've tried to do everything I can to support it. So give give us give us one give us one thing that you would do to bring fast tracks to Longmont sooner rather than later. Um, well, I guess one of the things I mentioned is let's get it back on the ballot and then raise enough money to, to make it happen. Let's get our train station built um, so that there's something to connect to, and uh, you know there's certain things that. That we can't speed up, you know. That we have to push through the EISs and, and other things that are just, you know, hurdles that we have to go through. But uh, so I, I guess just uh, um, you know, move it ahead as fast as we can. Thank you, Suzanne Painter. Uh, do you believe that taxpayer money should be used to enrich private business interests? We're talking about um, perhaps programs that were presented to Panasonic Development uh, when they were here talking to the mall, and uh, we were talking about uh, some of the tax incentives that were provided to them. Yes, I do. It's not new uh, in these uh, in this day and time. We are going to have to be creative in how we seek any retail, regardless if it's internet or not. And so, as a community, we're going to have to look around and see what is working for other communities where they have been able to uh, invest in retail up front and have it paid for uh, on the back end. Remember, retail is not just a place to go. Retail is what supports sales tax dollars. The lights, the streets being plowed, the greenways being mowed, sales tax dollars are on the decline. Somewhere along the line, we're going to have to make a deal and make a partnership and a collaboration that works for large uh, developers across the country. Panatoni was no small developer, 2,200 properties around the globe. I believe they knew a lot about what they were doing. And perhaps if we have come to the table with a little more creative plan, we too 
uh, could have saved that relationship and or moved something forward at some time. Now we start all over again, and I can tell you it will not be much more different than what we'd seen before. Thank you. Any other comments from any of the candidates regarding maybe tax increment financing or any other comments? Tax increment financing. Boy, I, I learned about that in 2005, way before I was on council. Um, let me explain what tax increment financing really is. Um, basically, it's um, kind of a, um, well, it, it's a, you're paying for the investments that uh, normally a development would, would make um, with the uh, uh, future tax money. So if we would have thrown $20 million of tax increment financing, meaning the additional money that was earned once the mall was redeveloped, all of that would have gone to the bonds, and not a single new penny would come into our general fund. Mr. Um, I think we get down to some very basic notions here. There is a role for government. There is a larger role for government when we have to use our resources as a community for the betterment of that community. And sometimes it involves being creative. Sometimes it involves incentives. Sometimes it involves disincentives. So I think we have to be very thoughtful in the approach, but we always need to be looking at the community and how we can make it better. I think there's some opportunities in the redevelopment of the wall. Thanks. Thank you. And Paul Tiger. Recently, council essentially ended the city's affordable housing inclusionary zoning program. What role do you think the municipal government should play in affordable housing? And if elected, would you work to save affordable housing? Uh, I uh, actually would uh, ask uh, for the people who uh, have been using affordable housing uh, to come up with uh, creative ideas and answers. I personally do not think that the city should be involved in affordable housing. That's not true of all cities. Um, I spend a lot of time in Aspen where the city owns uh, a great deal of property that they use for housing people, ski workers in, 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 the, in the season, and actually a lot of the people who work for the city live in the city-owned affordable housing, including the mayor. Uh, but uh, here in Longmont, we have a very large amount of affordable housing that is not owned by or governed by the city. And um, I have a, a couple of friends who own apartment buildings, and uh, I don't consider them to be slumlords. They're very nice with their tenants, and uh, also in, the, in home sales. Home sales now are, if you can qualify, um, but the city itself set a very narrow margin, uh, and the folks that qualified for the city they could then not qualify to get a loan. And so we ended up with a lot of stagnant properties. Um, I don't want to see that continue. Uh, I do believe that, uh, that uh, there's a, a number of people who want to have this, and a task force to look into that would be great. Let's get educated on something different, because what we had a quick follow-up question, Mr. Tiger. Yes. And uh, what about the, the distribution of affordable housing? If it sounds like uh, you would you agree with the if I'm, if of I'm affordable not, housing, if I'm not in favor of the government uh, controlling affordable housing, then uh, the distribution is a moot point. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Uh, uh, I'll try to keep things as even as I can, but uh, I'm not going to be on top of every hand raising, but I'll try to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know, affordable housing concerns me a lot. I, I know it has some problems, and we need to make some changes. My big concern was, uh, first of all, distribution. One of the reasons why we did this is we want to get a distribution of people throughout the city that can't afford a home necessarily. And I've heard suggestions, oh, let's put, just put people in rentals, let's just put them in, uh, you know, concentrate them in certain areas. Oh, I totally disagree with that. We don't need uh, problems, you know, where we're putting everybody in crowding them in certain areas. I think some of those people 
that, that did the work of building. Okay. I guess I have sort of a short response there. So. Thank you. And then Mr. Davis. Uh, I was on the council that instituted uh, those ordinances. I, I can speak really loud. Uh, that uh, instituted those ordinances. And at the time, the market was growing to such an extent, we were very concerned that we didn't uh, stigmatize certain parts of the community and wanted to spread the opportunity around. And I thought at that time, it was a good program. The markets have changed, I'll grant that. But I disagree with Mr. Tiger. I think there is a role for government. We always have to be balancing the needs of our community. And sometimes government has to step in. And I thought it was a good program. The market changed, and I guess we've decided to put it in hiatus or stop for now. Thank you. And Mr. McCoy. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, I was all for a, a task force to have this transparent uh, uh, review of uh, affordable housing. What happened is, is that uh, uh, a few members of the real estate uh, uh, board and, uh, uh, and, a, and the Boulder developer uh, decided that they were going to uh, uh, scuttle the whole program and they made sure that they worked behind the scenes and counted for now I can't couldn't count for it. and so they were able to make sure that we ended up uh, totally scuttling a very good program even when it needed to have a uh, a little bit of a uh, time out and refiguring of what was going on and I'll do my best at letting it go at five seconds Ten seconds to help finish the sentences. Who's got the rotten tomato to throw at us, though? Right. Uh, next question for Dennis Holmes: Should the airport runway be lengthened, and should the skydiving activities be encouraged or discouraged? Okay. What I would like to do is have a conversation with the skydiving company. Basically, eighty-five percent of the complaints seem to be caused by that twin otter. Uh, and I think there's some things that can be done that the city can do. They can have a dialogue and maybe convince them to change their mode of operation. One thing they could possibly do is take off and uh, fly somewhere else and drop somewhere else, and maybe the city can give them, you know, a 15-person van to take everybody back, or make some other tax, some incentives, so that we can find a win-win solution uh, for that problem. Um, first, airport expansion. Um, you know, I agree. There's two things that's, that's happening with this uh, airport. One is they're finishing this ribbon, which is a safety issue because it prevents crossover. I think that's really important. Um, the expansion. I believe if it was expanded, it's probably going to be a, a negligible impact. Sure, there's going to be some maybe one or two corporate jets a week, um, and they have maybe a 90 dB decibel, so they could be louder, uh, and that's going to affect some people. But if it did um, perhaps bring another big company in here that paid high-paying jobs, it's, it might be worth it. Um, I, you know, I feel sorry for the people who live by the airport, but I think the major problem to solve is that Twin Otter skydiving. So, and I think that we could possibly do that by just reaching out and finding some city incentives Maybe incentivize them to buy new equipment sooner. Um, I think there's some some things that we could work on in that area, and that's you know the city has very little control over that airport. It's an FAA, so outside of just talking to them and reasoning with them and trying to find a common solution, I don't know what else we can do. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Like oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gayos. Well, I'll give you. Okay. Can I have a clarification oh, from, I'll be the, quick. from the chairman? I'll be quick. So I, I just want to make sure I'm being fair. So I should give people like an extra five seconds. Of no, uh, thirty seconds, and then I'll and I'll see your sign, and <laughs> I'll make the decision on okay. stuff. So just you, know, you can help. Okay. Uh, let me know when that thirty seconds is up. Okay. Thank you. I don't think we need to have our airport expand uh, uh, runway expanded. Uh, it's a recreational airport, and uh, as more cities pander to jet traffic, uh, what we're going to get is more recreational opportunities out there. So ultralights and things like that, with a lower decibel uh, reading on those uh, particular types of air uh, air uh, planes. So I think we have an opportunity here 
to capitalize on recreation. And just like at our Union Reservoir, we, with our sailboats, we'll have recreation out there at the airport in that fashion. I think uh, we need to take advantage of the business opportunities expanding the airport creates. With that said, I think the city has probably the wherewithal to ban, and I think it's appropriate time to skydiving operation. We encouraged them years ago to re re relocate to other areas where the population wasn't a factor. It's become a nuisance now, and uh, for the handful of people it serves, it's not worth it. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. All right, I'll distinguish myself a little bit here by telling you that I'm not going to make an opinion one way or another until the master planning process is done. It is, uh, in my opinion, um, when you don't have the facts, you've got a master plan um, being worked through until we see what the results are, and we've only seen the first three chapters of the work, we can't make a decision. I want to take all the facts in consideration, the real facts. And Mr. Tucker? Again, lifelong learning. Uh, I uh, went to the airport uh, when we had uh, airport day or whatever it was we were having out there. It was actually pretty wonderful. Um, there was a gentleman there who had a jet, I believe it was a Gulfstream, who took it off, did several flyovers, it landed next to us. People could tell that it was very quiet. It was much quieter than the prop planes. Um, and uh, I, uh, as we at council, there was a presentation, and in that presentation we learned all about all of the kinds of planes that can be there, and big jets aren't there. They can't be. And I have a question for anybody who would like to answer. Is it, it seems as though a lot of the uh, question is that lengthening the airport runway will bring additional jobs to the city. Does anybody uh, here on the panel yes. have any information, have any facts uh, that would indicate so? Mr. Garriers. Uh, from the perspective that it offers us the opportunity to go out and recruit those smart jobs in the long run, it may be further down the line, but I think it's a definite tangible that we can't really lose. Ms. Spinner. I don't have that right on the voice. <laughs> I see some things, especially as the airport, and some of the same vein here. Uh, skydiving, uh, sky, this uh, skydiving association is one of the best known in the country. People come here from uh, pretty much all over the world to skydive in the beautiful Rocky Mountains. Um, if we're not uh, interested in putting events on our open space, if we're not interested in putting tax incentives forward for the sales uh, for retail, um, you have to ask what you care about and what you care enough about. And uh, in regards to the airport, I would like to see it as a retail outlet. Thank you. Sarah Levinson, how would you address the relationship between City of Longmont and St. Frank Valley School District? Do you generally support mill levies when put before the voters? Um, well, we have a good relationship with the school district. In fact, I had a conversation mm -hmm. with a school board member this afternoon. I think that any of us can pick up the phone and call the superintendent or any of the school board members and have a conversation on any number of topics. Uh, the uh, quality of your school district has a direct relationship to economic development and if the uh, adequate level of funding for schools now is to uh, have a mill levy, then I support the mill levies. Frankly. If you had kids in the school, you saw the effect of the bond and the mill levy almost immediately. Um, French got restored for my sixth grader that year when they didn't have a French teacher. They didn't have the money for it. So she got to take French. And that's the language she wanted to take. She didn't want to take Spanish or German. So I, I think that, again, um, school district is a, a great um, partner in many things. And um, we all benefit in the community. Not. I mean, it doesn't even matter if you have kids in school. If you want to have a, a, a good um, technician at the hospital, if you want to have great nursing staff at the hospital, if you want the person working on your car 
to be well enough educated they can figure out what the problem is, it goes back to how the school district educates people and their opportunities once they graduate with their high school degree to get technical education or be um, good enough to do some job in the community. Thank you. Um, well, I really value school and education. My wife's a teacher. My kids got an excellent education here. I think the only one thing we can possibly do to maybe improve uh, is spread the burden around a little bit more. I think some of the commercial people and commercial buildings pay an undue portion of tax. Uh, you know, like our building um, is worth $1.2 million, and we pay $35,000 a year in taxes, and that's a lot more. So if we could figure out how to fund schools without overburdening businesses, um, that would be good. Thank you. Ms. Spinner? It was my pleasure to sit on the steering committee of the We Choose Excellence campaign, bringing $180 million into the St. Bernard Valley School District and $17 million annually for technology. Nowhere else in the district was anywhere more impacted than when Ward 1. Skyline High School alone received $14 million. What a pleasure to see the pride and the integrity and the ambition and the engagement come back into teachers, administrators, and students. Truly, education is, the, is a never-ending journey. We will never arrive at a destination. And I encourage education always between the business community and education. Thank you. Ms. Levinson. So one other thing I'd like to point out, tax increment financing actually robs K-12 through education. Because one of the things that happens when you have a tip is any of the tax money that would go to the uh, schools gets paid in the increment. And the state, by law, has to backfill the funding that would normally go to schools. So there is currently a 60 to $80 million gap to K-12 funding from the state just due to tax increment financing every year. Thank you. So, okay. We're done? Yeah, I can yeah. So I'm going to pull from a little uh, nine news thing. I want to see a, a raise hands if you support the initiative in front of the state that's going to be in front of the state to increase taxes for school here. So. Thank you. And Mr. Gray, although this is a nonpartisan election, how would you characterize the voters to whom you most strongly appeal? Will you nevertheless pledge to listen to and faithfully represent all segments of Longmont? Yes. <laughs> I suspect that would be yes across the board there. So I, I, I know this has, uh, there are some that are trying to make this a partisan uh, issue here uh, I had, I had a your feelings towards that? I, I had a reputation while I was on council before, and I think it's true now, and a number of people who know me here sitting in this room, that I will sit down with anyone and listen to your side of the story. I will give you the opportunity to persuade me. I don't have a clo closed mind, and there are people I think in this room that will testify that I've changed my opinions on some issues. So, and I think you, you have to be, because at the end of the day, this isn't about D's and R's and I's and whatever other letters are out there, but really, we all need to be rowing in the same direction. This is our community. This is our vote. We need to make it better. We're going to have some fits and starts. There are things that we uh, didn't take advantage of, like annexing all the way to Del Camino to get that planning area uh, included in the city. It's, it's a lost opportunity. There are new opportunities, and I think we have to be thoughtful. So I think we have to be open to different approaches that different communities take, and I think everyone in the community should be respected and valued in their opinion as well. We won't always agree, but I'll listen to you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Painter. Perhaps this is one of the largest issues I believe Longmont struggles with right now, and that is leadership. And one of the catalysts for me running for council is truly that there are times that as a constituent I have felt like a meat thrown in between dogs and uh, it has not been well, it has not felt well. These are my neighbors, these are my friends, these are my professional uh, associates. 
These are people that I truly enjoy, respect. As uh, someone who would represent council, it's our responsibility and our duty to represent everybody and to listen to everybody. Anything less is not doing the job well. Follow-up question, would, would the candidates be opposed to showing up at a forum that might not be put on by a, a group that they would agree with or belong to their political affiliations? Could I see a show of hands? The question is, if, uh, if uh, another forum was presented by a, a different political party, would, uh, would you elect to go to that forum? Thank you. So this isn't the League of Women Voters? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McCoy, the LDDA has been here since 1982. And I want to preface this by, I, we haven't fact, fact checked any of these. So the LDDA, LDDA has been here since 1982 and has received more than $45 million. Why should we continue to support the LDDA when there are so many vacant stores and absolutely no support for the rest of the businesses on the rest of the three mile Main Street. Well, I, I, I think that uh, uh, you don't uh, throw out the LDDA just because you, you know, the other parts aren't getting their attention. Um, I think we should look at, at a midtown concept. Uh, uh, I'm of the opinion, and I've said this probably to uh, quite a few of you, that it's time that we go out after uh, the business and get out there and, and try to uh, drum up business for Longmont. And uh, and I've been told that uh, you know places like uh, Dillard's in the mall uh, already owns their building. So what? Are they in the business of selling clothes or are they in the business of uh, of uh, holding uh, property? If they really had Longmont's interest at heart, if they really were interested in selling clothes, then they'd go and consider somewhere else in town. Uh, the idea is strategy would be to have them move into the old Walmart uh, building and get some opportunity there. Same with Sears. But the, the approach recently has been that of uh, what they call free market. And, uh, and I kind of liken that uh, the Longmont style of free market by many of the leaders in the chamber and other uh, groups. <coughs> to uh, a uh, free market where you are a bachelor sitting on the, uh, dressed up and sitting on your front porch waiting for something to happen. And then the, uh, the night goes on and it gets late and uh, the bachelor, after he's dressed up and everything, goes inside and says he puts the cat out and brings the dog, uh, dog in and goes to bed and says, well, I guess there's no business today. Well, here's the deal. You've got to go out there and ask people, drum up that business, and there are opportunities. And uh, you just don't say, oh, gee, uh, you know, the opportunity is, uh, is not showing itself up today, so we're not going to worry about it. I think that's the wrong approach. I think we need to get something going up uh, in the uh, Kmart parking lot. And I think we also have to address some needs of the Latino community. The Latino community is, uh, is crucial uh, for having an opportunity uh, for them. Thank you. And, and just so the audience and the rest of the candidates understand, so um, I've asked one question of each of the candidates and maybe the disparity uh, or the time allotted is is associated more with the 30 second responses so i want to make sure that everybody understands that we're we're just churning it down the line and we'll try to make this as easy or as even as possible throughout the evening so my next question is going to be to my next question is going to be to mr gregors and then Thank you. I, uh, I have a business in the LDDA district. So I guess I'm concerned that uh, the Alleyscape project I think is a good one. I think there are components we need there in terms of drainage and undergrounding. But the front part of the, the LDDA downtown is still about 40% vacant. And I've suggested we create some kind of a revolving pool to get new tenants in and then let them pay back on the back end of their lease. In other words, we subsidize them coming in, they get their business feats about them, and then suddenly they pay back that loan. To me, we're taking an ass-back approach uh, by putting the, uh, the alley state in first. Thank you. And, and also, I'm going to reserve the right to stop the questions when I feel are appropriate so other candidates can also have the uh, uh, opportunity.
opportunity to answer some of these questions that are from the audience. Well, and, and John, I think that um, the idea of fact-checking the, the question might have been relevant here. The um, Downtown Development Authority actually is a, a, um, a geographic region of the city that has chosen to tax themselves at a higher level. And so some of those improvements that they make are really coming from additional taxes above and beyond what the city collects to do the work. I was going to point out the same thing. One thing that I did when I was on the LDDA board was work to expand the area. We included that Roosevelt building because that was outside of the LDDA and without us including them into the LDDA, they would have horrific parking problems they would have to solve. So I would like to see the LDDA district actually get bigger in the future. Ms. Mayor? We have several committees uh, and organizations, the LEDC, we have the Economic Development Director, we have the Assistant, we have the DDA, we have the right tools in place. I believe what we knew, we need our new landmarks and we need a new watermark to set the bar. And uh, I believe we need more accountability and, and more transparency about what these organizations are doing. They're working hard. How hard do you know that they're working? Uh, it, in Middle Maine, it, it's not working so much for us. And so I would like to see more accountability and more transparency. Thank you. And Mr. Hansen, did you have a yeah, comment? Yeah, I just want to point out the fact this is a good example where government does have a role to play. Um, we can catalyze things to a certain extent and then they'll eventually take off on their own, but I think we have to catalyze it to a certain level before it takes off on its own. And so I think that's something that's important to recognize. I also think it's important to recognize that you have, it's, this is like an entry corridor. Um, this is the first impression that a lot of people come, get when they come up 287 into Longmont. That does have a very real impact on us. We try to protect some of our other entry corridors, such as 119, 66, etc. So I think it's very important. Thank you. Quick comment. So we've gone now for 45 minutes, so we're right halfway through, and surprisingly, we're on schedule because we just went through our first round of questions. So we're going to start our second round of questions with Mr. Daniels. Mr. Daniels, what effort will you support towards job growth? Would you redirect? the activities of the LAEC, and do you have a sensitivity to creating jobs for current residents as opposed to jobs for people who would have to move here? Um, I believe that anything that we can do to encourage small business in this community based around services and uh, internet-based commerce rather than retail will be a good thing. Because um, as I said earlier, business is all headed that direction already anyway. So I would have to see more specifically which exact businesses are involved in order to make a more precise comment on this issue. Would you would you redirect the activities of the LAEC? Um, area. No comment. Uh, Ms. Painter. <coughs> Mr. Tiger. Oh, thank you. I was trying to move the mic in an even <laughs> flow instead of, but in either case, go ahead, Mr. Tiger. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, the base in Longmont uh, that LAEC is involved with is manufacturing, uh, not retail or, uh, or other things. Uh, but it's manufacturing. Um, I think that uh, I would say, have said uh, two years ago uh, that uh, I didn't uh, like them or what they were up to. Lifelong learning, I've learned a bunch of things in the meantime. Uh, I think that LAEC is doing a good job, that they are keeping jobs here and bringing jobs here. And I would like to see that continue and not be ready. Thank you. Mr. Coombs? I also think that uh, they're doing a great job and they're going after primary jobs, but let's not forget what secondary jobs like uh, my business do does. We have, you know, pay, payroll of like $1.2 million a year. We pay about 12% of the sales tax. We 
deal with about 25 local companies. So the velocity of money concept, we get people spending money over and over again, and that's important. And, and Mr. McCoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I think the entire board needs to be reworked because there are clearly some inconsistencies um, that could clearly improve the organizational structure. I've spoken with board members and primary employers about this, and they agree. We're paying for duplication of services right now. We need, contract, uh, we need a contract that rewards job growth and takes away funding for job losses. And uh, the city manager's office has employed its own field of experts. So, I really think that what we need to do right now is, is look at how many jobs were created uh, in the last year. I believe it's somewhere in the 90s. So. Thank you. And can we slide the mic down to Ms. Painter, please? And then Mr. Hanson. At a recent pint in politics in which the mayor, Alex Samori, and Katie Whit were present, I did ask that very question, which is how many jobs have been created? in the year 2011, how many bids have been won, how many bids have been lost, what cities have they gone to, what are we learning, where are they going to, and how can we do better? Even with the economic director in the room, nobody could answer that question. Truly, I believe Walmart residents deserve better. You're paying for it, and I believe you need to know what you're paying for. Yeah, I think one of the things that concerns me with our current council is we've had sort of a, well, even one of the reports that was before us, we've had a, a negative political environment for clean energy. And, uh, for example, we voted down the, uh, the concept of having uh, uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, um, uh, energy efficiency contest for homes, and our solar program was voted down. And I think we've got this reputation of being sort of, anti-renewable clean energy and, and, and going in that direction and I think that discourages some businesses in this area. Thank you. And I think Mr. Hansen is up next and remember this comes from the audience. So a well-rounded or I'm sorry a well-placed friend of mine told me that using Longmont United Hospital would cost city employees and the city more than the current insurance. Is that true and can you comment a little bit about uh, the decision uh, that was recently voted upon? Well, <clears throat> Long Island United Hospital is very local and there are, I'm sure there's a lot of employees that would like to use it. Um, but on the other hand, you've got to understand that the contract <clears throat> that we negotiated with Kaiser um, was the least expensive contract. There's a lot of, of our city employees that already have Kaiser and looking at some of the letters that have been sent to us, they clearly do not want to switch. They want to continue their coverage under Kaiser just because of the fact that they've had that. They don't want to switch doctors or anything like that. Um, and I think it's also very important to bear in mind there's a, about half of the city employees don't even live in, in the city of Longmont. So just because we would, if we were to try to connect the Longmont United Hospital in our insurance plan, that doesn't mean that a lot of people would necessarily be convenient for them. Um, so there was a number of reasons why we decided to stick with Kaiser. Um, another reason that we stuck with them is they're guaranteeing their rates out for a length of time. Um, the other insurance companies were not willing to do that. Um, we didn't get that many uh, proposal, big proposals in. It was very limited this time around. and so. Um, I, I guess it was somewhat of a difficult decision, but you know, just looking at it from the standpoint of the best finance uh, for, for the city and, and uh, the concerns of the City of Longmont employees, um, although I want to support our local hospital, we still had to do what was best for our city employees and the taxpayers that are, that are, helping to, that are paying for that. Thank you. Yes. Let me be sarcastic. You get what you pay for. Um, if you go for the cheaper deal, you may actually get the cheaper deal. Um, I, uh, I don't know what led up to this. Uh, I wasn't on council. I didn't read uh, all of the internal uh, memos and documents. Uh, however, my thought about it is, why not choice as in have both? Have as many. Let people choose. 
not force them into something. So we could have had uh, Kaiser and we could have had uh, Longmont United. Thank you. I want to see uh, another show of hands here. We just had a, a question submitted. Do you support the opportunity the City Council has to make statements on behalf of the community with the use of resolutions when it pertains to federal issues? Can I see a show of hands? Uh, for example, uh, maybe maybe the discussions that Council had on the DREAM Act uh, would be an example. So it is, do they, do the candidates think it's appropriate for Council to bring up more or less national issues? And of course we've tried to keep a lot of these questions to specific uh, City of Longmont issues and we'll, we'll broaden them a little bit here at the end if we have time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Payer, what are your views about bringing the rail park to Longmont and mitigating the impact on nearby neighborhoods? I'd like to see the numbers. I understand that we have now just uh, perhaps uh, gone ahead in looking to zone part of the rail park, if there was rail, proposed rail park. Are we talking about the commercial rail park in Ward 1? I'm just going to assume it. <laughs> And uh, I would like to see the numbers put up. It's my understanding that this is a, if we build it, they will come project. This is not the time. Uh, this is not the economy. This is not the time to rely on taxpayer dollars to build something, move forward, without some kind of uh, factual data to put forward. Uh, I believe you're smart enough, and once we give you those numbers, and if it bears itself out, then we move forward. If it does not, then we do not. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. My understanding, I could be wrong, was what they were doing was just passing the uh, structure so that they could have the zoning in place. They weren't actually, you know, approving a weird rail park at that city council meeting. So uh, I think it's okay to have the structure there so you can act quickly in the future. So, Mr. Mr. Grimms, would you support a rail park coming to? Uh to Longmont. I'd support that concept, um, although I, I wouldn't want it to be in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Tiger. And then, um, Ms. And then Ms. Levinson. Uh, I'm a I'm a crazy rail fan, uh, and right. I and I and I live in a town that is is crazy rail. I, I love it. You guys sit at the crossings, but I I enjoy it. So I actually think that we ought to do that because we're on mainline, we're on BN mainline, and they're using it. And even though we try to reduce their use by taking out trackage, they built more. And so they've got a switch yard here. It's not going away. It's actually we should embrace it because it brings commerce and it's transportation. And what about uh, Mr. Tiger? What about the unfortunate recent course of events? Uh, uh, the safety implications. Of Trench the train. Excuse me? Trench the train. Mm -hmm. Trench the train through residential Longmont. This is, I've talked about this at council before. Reno, Nevada did it. It cost them $19 million and the UP helped them. It took everything uh, to a level that was, I believe, 13 feet below the, the street and uh, all the flyovers and everything. It cost them about $20 million. Thank you. Miss Levinson. So yes, we indeed look, did look at um, a rail park zoning, and when I looked at the regulation, there actually was no requirement for any business to actually use the rail. Not a percentage, and every use, including allowing residential uses on the property, could all happen without a single one of those businesses having to actually use the rail. Thank you. This question for Mr. Tiger. What thoughts do you care to share about the fiber optic ballot issue? Pass it. Thank you. Uh, is that? I, I, uh, we own it. Uh, we built it. Uh, and it was stolen from us. Uh, and it will be dark forever unless we go back and keep, if we have to, 
come back again, again, again. I want our fiber back. I want us to be able to lease fiber to uh, all the companies that come. No one will come if we don't have the media. And Mr. Coombs. I totally agree. I was just shocked last time when Comcast spent all that money to defeat it. That was just a travesty. I just don't see how people didn't see through that smoke screen. So I'm, I think Tiger's got a great answer. And Mr. Hanson? I see no downside to us going ahead and reestablishing our use of that fiber. Um, but I think this is, once again, a perfect example how campaign or finance into our elections can really distort our elections with a lot of misinformation. And I think it's very important for us to recognize how important it is for us to know who's putting money into our elections. Mr. Gagos. <clears throat> uh, as I said earlier, we were on the council that secured the original uh, backbone uh, concept. This is the kind of issue that we, we all need to get involved in. It's bigger than a bread box. We have to tell our friends. We have to have our friends tell their friends. Because Comcast or whoever's out there is going to try and knock it off the ballot again. Everyone has to understand it's within the best interest of this community for us to have our fiber back, as Tiger said. And Ms. Levinson? When we were discussing it, I did uh, uncharacteristically, maybe, or characteristically for me, I um, made a little bit of uh, research by phoning other communities across the country that actually exercise their right. And lo and behold, if you pass the uh, regain your right to use your own fiber, um, you get a lot more attention from the companies that want to serve your community. They will try to come and outdo you. And I think it will provide better access for everybody. Thank you. Next question for Mr. Coons. What are your ideas, thoughts regarding Twin Peaks Mall? <laughs> yeah. This is the shortest, biggest question I did right. have. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Well, I mean, Everybody I talk to, they, they say they want a uh, movie, multiplex movie theater, they want some boutique um, stores, um, they want some nice restaurants. Um, you know, when I look at Belmar, that looks like just such a nice mall. But, you know, the reality is, right now, real estate prices are still dropping. That mall is totally underwater. They paid like $34 million for it. Uh, Few years back, it's probably worth about 17 million now, according to the county assessor. It's probably you know underwater with Bank of America. There's not a whole lot of options we have at this point. Uh, you know, we can't force Panatoni to develop them all. Uh, you know, we could start to work uh, with developers, talk to players, look at other case studies that were successful, and get the groundwork work so when the economy does turn around, we can act. Uh, but other than that, I don't have a magic bullet or solution to that problem right now. Mr. McCoy. Malls are, uh, are poor investments even in the best of times. Uh, I've met with the owners of the mall and some reasonable, and given them some reasonable suggestions of what they could do in the temporary. And, uh, you know, I voted to, to look at uh, this uh, as a uh, blighted area for the possibility of tipping it. Um, they were they canceled the Panatoni canceled coming to our retreat. They've uh, reduced. They've gone to the assessors to reduce their uh, their uh, fees uh, their their payments uh, tax payments on. This. I don't think they're good players. We'll find somebody that is. Mr. Ramos. <clears throat> There's a sheet out there where I have a press release and I basically say we need, need to use the condemnation process. The city of Denver used it many, many years ago to deal with their blighted area. Right now we're probably within a year of paying off both the bonds for the, for the library and the justice center. There will be a revenue stream. The price of money right now is very, very cheap. So we'd be foolish if we didn't go ahead and take the initiative to really force the owners and begin to 
the start the redevelopment process. Ms. Robinson? When you pull that, that trigger of eminent domain, the next time the government can come, they can come for your house. Eminent domain, if no one remembers the case, landmark case, um, Kilo versus uh, New Haven, Connecticut, the Supreme Court decided that um, governments could, could take people's land and their homes and their businesses if there was some greater economic um, plan for the land. And that project in Connecticut, where they took people's homes, it's still unbuilt. So, you know, we're going to start going down that path. We've got to be careful about private property rights, though. Mr. Tiger. <clears throat> it's private property. Uh, I don't think that we should be uh, in the practice of taking private property. And I agree with Sarah in every way on this. Um, I actually also believe that we should undo the blight designation because when we expanded the blight designation, we uh, blighted some green fields and we can't do that in Colorado unless you happen to be in Aurora. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Davis. Um, despite the calls from the alarmists, we use eminent domain every time there's an easement across your property for public service or the telephone company and whatnot, I think you have to elect responsible leaders. I think we need to get off the dime and really take some action. You know, we can't plant more bushes. It's a blighted area. The mall is dying every day. Thank you. The ne next question. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> And Mr. John Daniels. Uh, regarding the mall development issue, I think that um, absolutely the city should not invoke eminent domain in this issue. Um, I have strong moral, <clears throat> strong moral objections to any government body of being allowed to control privately owned property. Um, however, I think the city may be able to find some economic means to encourage development on a site where nothing has been done for many years. Um, given the cooperation, I'm sure that the City Council can find a way to move that forward. And Mr. McCoy. Listen, the, the mall, uh, <coughs> we could have tipped it, we could have been in that position right now. But the, the Penn and Tony Corporation in St. Louis didn't do anything until uh, to their mall there until they got all the anchors in place. You would never even know that the uh, mall had been tipped in certain areas. We could have done that two years ago. And the point is is that uh, uh, that the way that the partners uh, with Penn and Tony Corporation are working right now, they're just bad players. Maybe somebody else will be able to come in and do something positive. Thank you. And the next question for Ms. Sarah Levinson. It seems that most of the four to three votes by the City Council have favored real estate interests. Can you please respond to my perception? <laughs> well, you know what? I think the Board of Realtors would never, they, they wouldn't, I talked to them today. I don't think they would have come in, in front of us and said, um, you know, this is a board of realtors or a real estate issue. Um, I can't think of, except for um, the testimony of public invited to be heard on the affordable housing issue, that we actually had testimony except on that issue from the real estate community. So I, I guess I need to know what specific, um, you know, decisions <clears throat> and, and I'm going to take the liberty of expanding this a little bit. Is uh, maybe we're speaking of uh, development interests, real estate interests, development interests, uh, certain certain uh, controls on uh, uh, development throughout the city. Well, I know that we passed legislation around um, you know mixed use development, and we didn't have anybody from the real estate community coming and testifying against any of, or suggesting anything else in public hearing. Um, you know, 
we've been working on uh, different issues. I mean, <coughs> everything could be real estate. Sure. So I, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I don't have an unfavorable. The the meat of the question is, do I have an unfavorable view of the real estate community in Long Island? I say no. I mean, it's a you know, it's part of an industry. People have to buy houses. People have to 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 uh, buy property for commercial uses, and um, they're a segment of our um, our economy. Thank you. And Mr. Gallegos, did you have a comment? And then to Mr. Hanson. What we're kind of dealing here with is a historical fact. Up until lately, until the real estate market really kind of sunk, they probably were the largest single player in terms of the community. Now we have the opportunity with the internet, with the fiber optic backbone and whatnot, to begin to increase the number of smart jobs, which means that we need to maintain our environment and keep us at a competitive stance. Because historically development was the only game in town doesn't mean we have to continue in that fashion. Thank you. Mr. Hansen. <clears throat> this is all about uh, campaign finance again. I just look at the three, four vote distribution in the split and then just look at the records of who took money and it becomes very clear as to how those votes divide out. I mean, what, who voted to get rid of the affordable housing? We don't have anything in place to try to replace it yet, and we don't know we're, what we're going to get. Um, who voted against accessible homes? Those are homes that, a very small fraction of homes that are accessible to people that are disabled or elderly. Who voted for trying to do deferrals on, on fees or trying to get those kinds of things in, play, in place? So it's just that simple. Next question to Mr. Ayers. Uh, what is your position on the train noise? It says problem. You're assuming train noise problem. And please explain your solution. <laughs> I have a new question. I don't write them. I just ask them. I'm just asking. You know, my understanding, and this is from Mr. Tiger here, who's the train guy. This really should be a school. Can I give you this question? Uh, is, with the new technology, they've tra changed the decibel level that the whistles are making. Well, it's, it's, it appears to be louder. I, I'm not sure because I wasn't really paying attention to the old train whistle, but people are complaining. Um, it's one of those we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't situations because we need to be warning people when the trains come through town. And unfortunately, this is a community that is probably at the epicenter of trains in northern Colorado. And it's not going away anytime soon. I think we saw that one with the discussion of the rail park and whatnot. So in a sense, you know, we're kind of hoisted on our, our own guitar, and I don't know what else to say. Is there a problem with, in your opinion, is there a problem with train noise? Now, I have a problem with cats off leashes, but nobody asked me about that. You know, um, it, it can, it can, I can be annoyed. I, I live in Northwest. I don't have any trains within three miles of me, and I can hear them at midnight. So I'll grant, yes, they are noisy. And I think you have some time left if you want to answer the cats off leash. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm no, sorry. No, no. Put cats on leashes. <laughs> sure. I just wanted to do this. I'm uh, Next question is for Mr. McCoy. It appears to be a two-part question. What do you think are the top three challenges that Latinos face in Longmont? What will you do to make sure these challenges are met? Well, as many of us have heard, um, more people uh, that are uh, that are hurting in our economy that are the are the folks that are uh, people of color, uh, our, our uh, African American population in this country, our Latina population, and, and uh, other populations that make up that, uh, the, the rest of, of that uh, uh, concept there. The, the issue is, is that, that uh, I think what we need to do is, uh, is work with those folks uh, and help them establish a, an understanding that, that, that um, 
when uh, <coughs> when they're out in the community that they're welcome, that they're, they they feel comfortable, that they, that uh, we're willing to work with them in regards to uh, providing them uh, the same opportunities that uh, uh, that uh, other folks have to get loans for small businesses to uh, access uh, uh, commercial sites uh, and uh, and to uh, to be able to uh, uh, to process work through the process of the system in regards to going after uh, sales tax licensing and that type of thing. What I would propose right now to, to help folks that uh, would like to start new businesses uh, is uh, to uh, a Mercata possibly up in uh, the uh, Kmart parking area to get to get things started that way. Uh, encourage uh, growth uh, within the Latino community to uh, to expand their businesses. I, I, I think that this is a difficult one because of this, the difficulty in the economic times that we're facing right now. Everybody is facing it, but nobody is facing it as difficult in our community as, as much as the Latino community. So that is really uh, hard to, to answer that, that whole question. I, I hope I do. Sure. Well, thank you. Mr. Gallegos and then Ms. Painter. You know, I agree with Colin Powell, and I, I still think education is the magic bullet to really help uh, these people economically. And it, it really means, though, that I don't think we need big programs. It, it means we mentor through our churches and through our neighborhood groups so the kids know how to read. They value the written word. They value the library. I, I think. These are the things that we can do, small incremental steps that will help, not grandiose programs. Because once a kid learns to love a book, he's got that magic key, and he hopefully can change the situation. Thank you. Ms. Mayor? And then Mr. Cooks. Ward 1 is the largest demographic of Latino population, and this conversation is very important to Ward 1. Education sincerely and youth in, in the demographic of Ward 1. Uh, Latinos have the lowest graduation rate currently. Uh, I recently facilitated a strategic retreat for El Comite. Uh, the Our Center uh, is very active with the Latino community. And I've also been engaged with the um, I Have a Dream Foundation. And my question to you is, can you get out and you get involved? Can you patron their stores? And uh, can you be part of the communication link that embraces them? Thank you. I think the city needs to reach out um, more to this community and get them more involved on our boards. Uh, and they need to also reach up too. It's a two-way process. I think we both need to work harder. You know, basically a city will never be a great city unless uh, it learns to embrace inclusivity. And uh, we have some great Hispanic people that work at our restaurant. We, have a wonderful uh, relationship with Lamos Plumbing, um, and, some, and I really value the culture of the uh, Hispanic community here in our town. And, Mr. Tiger and then Ms. Levinson. Uh, while I'm a cracker, I know the difference between a Latino and a Hispanic. It's a, it's a conversation Ron and I have. It's Hispanics. We have here Latinos are Puerto Ricans. That's <laughs> where I come from. Um, I live in Ward 1. Uh, I've had foster boys who were uh, Hispanic. Uh, there's uh, lots of Hispanics in my neighborhood. Um, they, I think that education is the key. And one of the things I'd like to educate them about is the culture that they live in. If they're not in school and not in grade school, then they don't know about that culture. And Ms. Levinson and then Mr. Hanson? You can't tell I'm not Latino. I do sit on the El Comité board as a council liaison. And uh, what I hear as a challenge is, if you walk down the street and you're Latino, your biggest challenge is somebody walking past you who's non-Latino wondering if you're legal or not. And are we going to make assumptions about people in our community? Are we going to respect people for who they are? And you know, a, a challenge if you're here and you're Latino, if you don't speak English very well, where are the resources so that you can become a better English speaker? How to connect with the community. Mr. Hanson? I 
know you were just asking for three issues, but I can think of four. Um, one of them I just mentioned the uh, discrimination, education, affordable housing, and job opportunities. I think those are all very important. As uh, uh, Suzanne Painter just pointed out, we are in a very uh, predominantly, our board is predominantly uh, Latino or, or Hispanic, however you want to say it. And so, um, and, and I really try to work with our, our community. I, I know a lot of our neighbors. I don't speak Spanish. Um, I should speak Spanish so I can communicate more, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm in that community. Thank you. So, to keep, uh, to keep on time, I want to ask one question to each of the candidates. Same question, and we will start with John Daniels. And this question is, what will you do to bring business to the downtown area? And uh, what's your opinion about uh, the city being involved in uh, downtown parking structure to potentially help promote downtown businesses? I think that if, um, if there's a desire to attract more retail business to the downtown area, one of the best ways to do that will be to, if possible, lower the local sales tax <clears throat> regarding the parking structure concept. I think that this perhaps is something that the city council should encourage a private business to undertake. I don't think this is the kind of thing that the city should operate itself. For a variety of reasons, I yield the remainder. Okay. And we're going to go right down the line. So, Mr. Hanson, we're going to each have two minutes to answer this question. Um, we're all answering the same question? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you know, talking about the downtown parking structure, I know this has been brought up many times. I, as I recall, the numbers were when you get into a layered structure, it's somewhere around $20,000 per lot. Um, and I think you really have to weigh that against other opportunities. But I do recognize the fact that if we're going to invest a lot into our downtown redevelopment, which I think is critical, as I mentioned before, that downtown area is a, an entry corridor. Everybody sees downtown when they first come here. So I think it's very critical that downtown, um, that, that we catalyze it to a point that we can um, you know, make it so it's sort of self-sustaining and we don't have to put much effort into it anymore. And parking is a real critical issue for downtown. There's just not enough parking. Um, I think some of the projects that we're trying to do to, to make the alleys look a lot better are going to be very helpful um, because a lot of people just can't park out on Main Street. So the only option is to park in the alleys. And it would be nice to have really attractive alleyscapes. And um, I, I think we're really going in the right direction by doing that. <coughs> Again, if we, we start expanding parking, we have to look at how much the real estate is going to cost to do some of that, um, and what kind of you know walkways and bikeways and, and the like are we going to have to, to give people conduits to, to get them to those downtown businesses. Um, but I do think that the parking is very critical, but I'm not convinced that a parking structure is the solution to the problem. And I think it requires um, further investigation and once again, I think that, that public input element is very critical in the whole process. I'd like to see a commitment to downtown Longmont, and I think it's for the betterment of the community in the whole, not only as a revenue source, but as a collaboration point for our community. I'd like to fortify the DDA, the economic director, and the city staff to smooth the operations and the processes in order to move business and retail forward. Quite frankly, the Alice Gates to me and the parking structure is uh, like putting on great shoes with the wrong dress. And uh, I believe uh, the retailers downtown are looking for customers. Alice Gates are great, but it's putting the cart before the horse. It's, it's uh, people and patrons that they need in order to buy. I'd also like to see the community get behind things like Art Walk. Uh, on a more regular basis. We have fantastic people in our downtown area and I would just like to see a, more of an investment and a true commitment uh, in not uh, leaking to the rest of the community and taking patrons elsewhere to purchase and spend time. Um, I'm in favor of a uh, 
parking structure built by or built for the city, and that the city be the owner of the parking structure. Uh, years ago, Boulder, I don't want to compare with Boulder, but I did live there for 18 years, uh, got themselves a, a parking lot that somebody else built, and then they ended up owning it. And then later on, they built their own parking lots. Uh, I, the, uh, the Thistle parking lot, there was a proposal for a parking lot that was mixed use and so forth. It actually ended up having, I believe, six spaces less than we have there now. Um, uh, but that was a failure. That failure was not, you try again, let's do it again. Um, but what we want is a parking structure, not mixed use. Uh, I think that downtown will benefit. People drive through and they don't see a place to park and they keep driving. What if they saw a sign that said multi-story parking lot right around the corner? I, I think that yes, it will get used. Uh, otherwise, um, we can only allow people to come here by train. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, you know, being a downtown business owner, uh, you know, long term I'm in favor of a city owned parking lot. I think it would be good for downtown. Uh, I actually agree with the alleyscape, not for the beautification and the artsy part of it, but the drainage part needs to be solved. And as long as they're training that, if they can make it pretty at the same time, you know, it is a real serious drainage problem in those alleys. Uh, and then centralizing the trash locations is going to be really nice for a lot of businesses. It's going to make it more efficient. So I support that. Uh, you know, currently, a lot of parking is just education. You know, we educate our customers, like in the evenings, there's all kinds of, all kinds of parking on this side of Maine, over by the county building, there's all the empty streets, parking, and you just have to walk across 6th Street Mall. We really do not have a parking problem that would cause us to want to invest into a parking structure right now until the economy starts to turn around and it's a little bit lower risk uh, to our taxpayers. Uh, I, I like to do the planning, and uh, but uh, I, I know my partners would probably kill me for saying this, but I, I don't really think that we have a real serious parking problem. It's an education problem. It's training people to learn how to walk a half a block to go to your restaurant. You know, you can't always just park right in front of us, and that's why you know a lot of us have weight problems. We just don't want to walk. So. <laughs> So one of the things that I learned when I um, started looking at downtown issues, um, first of all, the, the first uh, year I was able to get a crack at the capital budget, I saw all this, these projects for downtown in the unfunded section. Mm -hmm. And knowing about Focus on Longmont, that downtown was one of those prime areas in Focus on Longmont, I said, well, why aren't we doing something about all this unfunded stuff that's going to help downtown? And I think that when you look at the uh, public investment in infrastructure, business follows that. I think that business owners, when they see uh, terrible alleys that are ice jams in the wintertime and it's dangerous to cross, that's a liability for their business. How would you expect those business owners to redo their facade or um, invest in their building structure if the city has given them substandard pathways and um, services, and a cluttered looking alley. Um, frankly, um, the drainage problems should have been taken care of a while ago, and uh, I think the alleyscapes are a good investment of money that other people, it's going to spur some additional investment. Um, and then, uh, as far as the uh, parking structure, we talked to um, uh, a long time um, construction person in Longmont who reminded me before I lived here, when the Justice Center was being put in, someone had suggested putting in a tiered structure right there where the, it drops off. Was chosen not to do that. Maybe that was an oversight. Um, I think that we've got neighborhoods on either side of Main Street that are walkable to downtown. There could be a lot of business coming out of those neighborhoods that are supporting downtown. So that's every time somebody walks, that's a $20,000 parking space you don't have to build. So it's not only marketing and education, as um, Dennis pointed out, but um, you know, people uh, looking at the advantages of living downtown and using um, the businesses that are there. Uh, I've had three businesses downtown, 
Uh, one on Kaufman for about 12 years, and now I'm on Kimbar. Here's the dirty little secret to downtown. There is no comprehensive master parking plan. So outside my office, I've got 30-minute zones, two-hour zones, and 20 spaces where people park all day long. And lots of those people are city staff. The same people who told us that they had to have the spaces under the library to park, to park their cars all day long. Now, I won't pick on Phil Dovecchio. Oh, yes, I will. He used to park his Lexus there all day long. Okay? The other problem we have, so consequently, if we had a master plan to deal with parking, we eventually would have meters. If we had meters, we had the kind of synergy in terms of business downtown, similar to Santa Fe, then that drives the demand for parking garages because they pay for themselves. So we fill the other side of the, the equation, those empty storefronts along Main, that 40% that's vacant, we really never will need a parking structure, but until we take a sensible approach, we're going to have problems. Because in the middle of that same neighborhood, the, your neighborhood, yes. your neighborhood complains to me day and night. I still get calls like I were on council, and I'm not. Comcast, Comcast is mis-zoned. They shouldn't be there. They have both a retail and a wholesale operation. So those trucks are on Main Street when they shouldn't be there. And their employees spill over into your neighborhood, are parking in front of your houses all day long, so you can't park there. Consequently, we have all these impacts and we're not dealing with them. We need to deal with logically. And I think the answer is the synergy, if we get the business going along the Main Street corridor, will generate enough revenue to pay for a parking garage. And my time is up. Thank you. So, when the parking garage that uh, was proposed was uh, kind of uh, uh, put to rest due to several different components, uh, whether it was uh, folks that uh, didn't want uh, that to go through or, or what, uh, um, we, we ended up, you know, losing out on that opportunity. So. You know, I encourage diagonal parking. Now, it wasn't the greatest solution, but it was at least a solution. And it was something that uh, they tried, and it seems to be working relatively well. Not not great. I'm not going to say that uh, uh, we have everything down right. You know, we do have 30-minute parking, two-hour parking. We have other uh, uh, parking issues associated with it. But, you know, downtown isn't just the LBBA. And now that 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 uh, parking garage is, 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 uh, is no longer on, on the books and not no longer being considered, it's kind of moved out of sight. I think we need to focus down on our First Avenue station plan where there may be a possibility of a parking garage at that point because that's the next newest place that we could probably make that happen. You know, as far as economic opportunities for Long on, you know, I think our city staff should be uh, beating down the doors to uh, the Cabela's Corporation. I've talked to the city manager about this. There's a possibility. I know there's uh, uh, some thinking that maybe there's uh, some way of getting them to come to town. But you know, if we talk about a river walk opportunity, the river rock walk opportunity for Longmont and the downtown, meaning our Main Street area uh, as a total, that is a that is a real possibility. And we just looked this past uh, night at uh, council about. Uh, maybe some recreational possibilities, which would encourage the Cabela's to come down to uh, Longmont. And so I'm, I'm encouraging growth along that, that uh, Main Street corridor, and, uh, and maybe that is the synergy that we're talking about. Thank you. We're getting close to that time. So I want to say that there were many more questions that we didn't address, and I sincerely apologize for that. Dream Act questions, immigration issues, Chamber of Commerce questions, human services, drinking water and fracking, climate change, not change, nonprofits, uh, council's commitment to their positions. Uh, so I want to apologize for those who didn't get their questions asked, but uh, we want to keep it on time.